Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Stephen Balcom. Thank you. I see my relatives are here. That's great. All right. Well, welcome back. I hope you've had some invigorating breakout sessions. I've certainly enjoyed a number of them. Uh, a couple of them were standing room only, which was pretty impressive. Um, so now we have a rather special panel uh, focusing on issues from a Global South perspective. And to help us in this discussion, I'm delighted to welcome our moderator, Anthony Robinson. Anthony is an inclusive national security and foreign policy leader working in international and government affairs. He is a strategist and a problem solver, a DEI advocate, a veteran, and a relationship builder. And most importantly, he was recommended by Cordell Carter of the Aspen Institute, which is all I needed to know. Please welcome Anthony and his wonderful panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Excellent, excellent. So you already heard I'm a veteran. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, so I like a little loud call and response sometimes. We'd like to welcome everyone to this great panel today. I'm extremely excited to be here with uh, a group of rock star panelists. I don't know how often that term is used in this, in this space, but I want to sanction it today. We definitely have some rock star panelists here today. Um, you heard Stephen give my background. This is a very interesting intersection of security and policy. While I don't work directly in the tech field, this has a very, it's very meaningful for me and very timely. I think it goes without saying that uh, the internet is global. You all have probably seen the headlines with, uh, from the US uh, across Europe, they're trying to remedy and uh, mitigate online harms. And let's just be truthful, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times these harms uh, impact the most marginalized, uh, especially in the global south. So what we want to do today in this great panel that's focused on uh, online safety in the global village, we want to examine online safety work being done across the global south, including regulations, uh, the experience of families, and the industry's best practices. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it, and I'm going to introduce my panelists by name. And as you introduce yourself, um, if you could also answer the question, how does online safety work factor into your day job? So we have Pratista Aurora. Dr. Mashilo Baloka and Daniel Lessa. So, Pratishta, if you would. Thank you, and namaste. Um, I'm Pratishta from Social Media Matters um, in India, and um, we work extensively on online safety in India and with young minds, young children, young adults, and also now expanded to teachers and parents. So, um, what brings me here is uh, my work in India that I do, on, on ground especially, also on the policy lines and the research that we do. So um, yeah, from my day-to-day -day job is that, you know, I help in um, programming and shaping uh, innovative uh, programs for children, especially, that we design. And also, I'm trying to bridge the gender and technology aspect of it. So uh, that's what uh, I have been doing in India. and. To just to share about a little, work, a little more work about what we do in SMM. At SMM is that um, we recently kind of, you know, did a long drive from um, the western coast to the eastern coast uh, in a 45 days span, uh, inter introducing into 15 cities uh, and kind of, you know, touching upon 19 educational institutions, interacting with all the young minds uh, of, uh, and also learning from them, especially of uh, what they experience on ground when it comes to digital safety. So uh, we had a lot of kind of, you know, conversations, intense conversations with these young minds, especially uh, from school as well, who shared um, the vision of how we need to integrate more of online safety curriculum and approaches uh, that schools and also educational institutions need to adopt currently. Um, apart from that, when I'm trying to bridge gender and technology, uh, women and girls, they have been my key focus area coming from that background. So sharing uh, the fact that, you know, girls in India still hesit are hesitant of sharing the online spaces. They, they, they kind of, you know, believe that, you know, our, our kind of presence in the online spaces 
um, needs to be more needs to be addressed more safely because uh, only one third of women in India still they're accessing internet. So that's being the largest country who, which has kind of you know uh, uh, huge cultures and languages. Just to say, 121 languages that we share across the uh, country is uh, where we feel that you know. Uh, we are still trying to develop more of uh, programs around what we think uh, that India needs to shape. And um, at the policy level, uh, kind of, you know, we are trying to bring it more into the cultural nuances and make it in, making it more cultural specific that uh, each state has its own kind of, you know, specificity of uh, what India can address into the digital safety spectrum of um, the work that we are doing. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Baloka. Thank you very much, Anthony, and the FOSI team for the invitation. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm Mashiro Baloka from South Africa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Film and Publication Board. Uh, this is a statutory uh, online content regulatory um, institution in South Africa which exists to regulate um, uh, uh, the, I mean, what you call in South Africa or in, in our law prohibited and harmful content. That's what we are responsible for. Uh, prohibited content is similar to what I think in many jurisdictions called illegal um, kind of content uh, that is distributed online. Now, in line with that, we are a complex regulator in the sense that we are three regulators in one. The first part of our work, which is what we have been doing, we are one of those oldest entities in South Africa born in, 19, in the 1960s, where we classify movies, games and so forth. We continue to still do that work. Um, then secondly, we, we run a, a hotline for the protection of children. Hence, we are a member of um, um, uh, a, a, a network called um, uh, uh, InHope. Um, we are a member of that and we are also serving on the board of that. And secondly, um, since last year, we have been given the responsibility um, over the online space, where in which we register uh, um, uh, what you call commercial online distributors. In other words, your TikTok, your Meta, whatever, if they want to operate in South Africa, they get um, registered with us. Uh, it's a new mandate that you've been um, given, but I think it's challenging, um, but, but I hope we'll try to do our best to, 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 to deal with that. What brings me here is the fact that um, the, the, the online space um, knows no boundaries, knows no borders, Therefore, it's important that all of us need to collaborate and learn from each other because no one can claim to know it um, um, across. All of us are learning. And one of the most interesting things is that if you look at it, uh, it's quite interesting that countries in the global south are leading, you know, your Australia, your Fiji, your uh, New Zealand, they're the ones that are leading. So for me, that's one thing that is different about the online space. And, and I think um, one of the things that we are doing, and I'm quite happy that there was a movement that was launched last year, I think probably we'll talk about it, um, um, Online Safety Regulators Network as a new movement. It was launched here at FOSI. Mm -hmm. And that's why last time I attended this uh, event virtually, this year I said, I'm not missing it. No matter how long it is to come from South Africa, a single trip of about 15 hours to get here, I said, I'm, I'm coming visually to interact, collaborate and learn from other colleagues because we have to learn each and every day. The moment you start learning, um, I think in this space will fall flat because it's a rapidly changing and evolving environment and no one can deal with this alone. We need all of us to collaborate. There is government regulators, civil society, uh, companies, we need to collaborate to deal with it better. So that's why I'm here, to learn as much as possible. And I've already started learning a lot. Yeah, Thank bro, you. Dr. Voloka. Thank you very much. Daniel. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Lessa. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be with you today. Um, I'm vice president at TMG. Um, we are a consulting firm, um, and we, we focus on ICT regulation and policy um, in emerging markets. Um, so our target is uh, both uh, industry as well as government and multilateral organizations, uh, and we develop um, research, uh, we develop um, advocacy, and we help uh, different governments in, in defining their policies, uh, writing rules, regulations, laws, um, with uh, the objective of ensuring that uh, you know, uh, technology, digital technology in particular, uh, diffusion around the world um, is equitable, um, but also safe. 
Um, and we, um, we focus primarily, as I said, on emerging markets. Um, and what we try to do, and the reason that I'm, I'm here today, is also um, uh, to focus on a piece of research that, that we undertook on child online safety um, across uh, nine countries, uh, most of them emerging markets, uh, to understand parental perceptions of risks as well as strategies uh, to, uh, to protect children online. Um, so I'm, I'm eager for, uh, for the conversation and, and uh, you know, I hope you guys have a, a great time and, and learn uh, something from uh, our collective experiences and how other markets, uh, emerging countries, are grappling with these issues. As uh, Dr. Boloka mentioned, uh, these are global issues. Uh, technologies, digital technologies are global in, in scope and in footprint um, and also affect uh, a lot of the uh, children as well as adults uh, around the world in different ways. Uh, and I think we can uh, probably talk a little bit about how that is and how different cultures, um, you know, internalize a lot of these uh, technologies and the perceptions around them, uh, how they differ among countries. Well, Daniel, I'm glad that you're eager to start the conversation because my first question is for, for you. And we're also, we're going to, uh, before we wrap up today, we're going to take uh, questions from the audience as well. And I just want to say not only are we speaking to the people in front of us, we're also we're live streaming as well. So this will be recorded so that people can uh, catch up with us after this. So, Daniel. So much attention has um, gone into what the US, the UK, and the EU are doing in online safety, but online safety impacts everyone. And I'd like for you to kind of give us kind of the 30,000 foot view of some of your research that you've done, uh, which was just recently released, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what are the biggest things that you see are missing from the international online safety conversation? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, we, um, we just published last month uh, a report together with the ITU. Uh, which was uh, uh, sponsored by Netflix. Um, and what we, um, what we did is we uh, did research surveys as well as uh, qualitative research in uh, nine countries around the world, most of them uh, in the uh, global south. Uh, we covered countries such as Brazil, um, Nigeria, Egypt, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, India, Indonesia, and also the US and France. Um, and what we tried to do is understand how parents perceive uh, their, ch their children's online experiences, uh, but also uh, looking at it from the different types of, of services that are available online. So we wanted to understand what was in these services and what was in the features that services, uh, different services provided children that really raised concerns for parents in terms of risks, but also to understand parental perceptions in terms of actual harm. Um, and among the things that, that we found is um, that parents in emerging markets uh, certainly have different uh, views on how their children use technology as well as the benefits and risks associated with technology um, and, and typically uh, responded to, to our survey um, in terms of understanding that they were kind of at the center uh, of, of this ecosystem and they were really the responsible parties in, in most cases about their child's online experience but nevertheless um, were seeking help and support um, both from industry in many cases, as well as from schools and educators, um, as well as from government in some cases. And, and one of the things that came out of the study as well is that cultural diversity in terms of concerns that different uh, services raise in different jurisdictions. Um, and, and the notion of the need to balance uh, both uh, the perceived benefits, which were present mostly across the board in all the countries we looked at, with those perceived harms um, in terms of different services. Um, and I think one of the things that comes out of, of, of this research, hopefully, that will trigger um, potential information uh, for policymakers uh, in emerging market, markets is, is the idea that um, you know, the same services have different impact uh, for, different, um, for different groups within a country, as well as uh, different impacts w uh, for different groups among countries. Um, so that customization of tools and uh, you know, mechanisms to assist parents in, uh, you know, in protecting their children online is something that comes out of, of this re research as a recommendation both from a policymaking perspective but also from an industry perspective. Um, so I mean, I, I welcome uh, you, you to 
to review it and see it and, and, and hopefully we can have a discussion around that either in the panel or after the panel as well. So that's a, a good lead in and thank you for talking about where I consider policy is where the rubber meets the, the road. But oftentimes policy makers are so far removed from what's happening on the ground, they miss the mark on what is really needed. And Patricia and Dr. Baloka, I would love to hear from you about whether you, in your countries, what are you seeing as some of the major obstacles or the challenges? And Dr. Uh, Patricia, we'll have you go first, but Dr. Baloka, I would like for you to uh, speak to the work that you're doing with the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, which congratulations to you, you were just appointed as the vice chair. Of, uh, of that network, so I would love for in your uh, answer to, to tackle that. But Patricia, please. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, on the aspect of challenges, I just want to kind of, you know, give one of the recent cases that we, I, like, I experienced from the on-ground work that I was doing. So one of the girls from the workshop, she came, to, she came up to me and she said that, while we are advancing in technology, but what are we doing on the aspects of online safety for us? So that really hit me really hard of that, like she's true, that we have technology which has advanced to a level, but we lack in a lot of, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure that we do not have in India right now. Um, the resources are limited. Uh, we also, there are very limited awareness programs that are currently going on. Like there are only a handful of organizations that are actually working dedicatedly on online safety in India, including social media matters. But what I see is that the programs are limited, hence the outreach among the masses is limited. We, we tend to cater to the tier one cities, but we tend to forget tier two and tier three cities in India, mm -hmm. wherein we cannot root into the interiors of India to talk about what is internet and what is internet safety over there. So uh, social media matters basically, you know, thrives of, you know, going to these uh, regional uh, areas to speak to people, to speak to children, to speak to adults who are using and consuming data online because internet has actually reached them. Mm -hmm. Just that, uh, but they, they lack in awareness around it. Yeah. So we tend to go and bridge that uh, by educating them, by generating that kind of awareness. Hence we design our programs in such a way that you know, we can connect with more at the interiors. Mm -hmm. So, um, also at the policy levels, we are not backed up with any of the policies uh, or the laws in India right now, though we are shaping one. Um, but yes, still we are kind of, you know, finding it hard to protect our users online. So uh, these are some of the challenges that I have experienced uh, in person uh, and firsthand as well. So uh, this is what I come from, uh, you know, with my experience on ground. That's great. And you're also doing workshops as well. Training is very important when it comes to the understanding and implementation. Dr. Baloka. Good, thank you very much. For me, there are three um, challenges that we deal with um, as the Freeman Publication Board. The, the, one, the first one is um, fragmented and outdated legislations in the sense that for many jurisdictions, so you find that there are multiple regulators or legislation governing this space. And therefore, there's always that contestation for space. Um, and also in South Africa, for instance, we don't deal with broadcasting. We've got another regulator who deals with that. But at the moment, technology is converging. Therefore, there is, I mean, whether, what is it that you define as broadcasting? Because content is distributed in any platform. I think mm -hmm. there is still a process to deal with that, but it's taking slower. Meanwhile, the damage has been done. And I think that's the first one. The second one is around uh, cultural nuances on technology. Like we talked artificial intelligence. South Africa has got 11 official languages. To each language, you are likely to get about six or seven dialects. And a lot of what you call prohibited content, which talks to your um, hate speech, uh, content that incite violence, a lot of it is not tweeted or distributed in your normal language. It's largely in, in those uh, dialects. And therefore, no amount of technology, trust me, can help you to deal with that. That's why then we need the fiscal online content moderation that understand those cultural nuances. Then the third one, which I think is very important, is around public education. That wh what we need to do is how do we talk to these young people in the language that they understand? I mean, if you have to say, and I, I often see that with, with my team, if I go and try to talk to children, the kind of conversation that they will have with me uh, won't be the same as when they have their peer-to-peer. -peer. Hence, we establish what we call the youth council. The youngest is 13, 
this allows for more conversations. And instead of saying uh, there's technology that can help, to understand, help them to understand, but nothing beats the word of mouth. For me, that's very, very critical in terms of taking out public education program. But the last things around the need for us to collaboration, like I said. On this Global Online Safety Regulators Network, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have uh, the, my chair for the next session there is Jill Whitehead from Ofcom. Um, we have been doing an excellent work. I think it is the brainchild of uh, Julie from East Safety Commission in Australia and it was launched here. Uh, it has grown quite f uh, phenomenally in the last couple of months in the sense that today we, we talk about six or seven members. We've got two categories. The category is statutory regulators. In other words, the ones that are legislated. Then from there, we've got what you call um, uh, observers who are not regulators, but any organization that share the same values, whether it's an NGO, but they want to do online safety protection. We still have got those numbers growing. I've got no doubt that next year will be, um, um, uh, we have exceeded the numbers that we have thought. We are working even now on um, the systems. Uh, I hope we'll be able to take it together. We are laughing with Gio that I think our task is to build on the work that, that uh, Julie has left behind. Mm -hmm. But we, because what is important, the need to collaborate across, whether locally, whether internationally and regionally as well. Mm -hmm. So no one is left behind because the element of inclusivity is quite key. So that's what we're doing. I'm lucky to be the, the vice chair. Um, <laughs> happy to be led by a wonderful woman, very excellent. So yeah, that's what excellent. I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, I, I like that piece about everyone coming to the table. It takes everyone. And um, in the space, the DEI space that I've worked in, we, we often use the term having more people at the table, but unfortunately sometimes they've given us broken chairs at the table and are either we're just not invited to the table. So Daniel, I would like to, for you and Patricia uh, as well, to talk about how we can include more voices um, in, this, in these policy, product, and parenting conversations and what barriers are there that you think that prevent a truly global vision of online safety work? Because I, I just heard this great, I, I think I was telling Patricia earlier, heard this great uh, quote, and I can't take credit for it, but you can't do, you can do nothing for us with, or about us without us. So we, we oftentimes we're bringing people to the table, but not the right people. So uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. How can we bring more voices into the conversation and who's, who's missing? Yeah, I mean, I think initiatives like this mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is, a, is a good start uh, from speaking with the uh, organizer. I think this is the first year where there is an international panel uh, in, in this event, and I understand it will be followed on uh, in, in the following uh, editions. Uh, it's certainly, um, you know, having dialogue among the practitioners is, is, is a key component. I think, you know, from the perspective of the work that we do, um, what we find is that sometimes it's, it's difficult to get engagement, mm -hmm. uh, even, even if policymakers, um, you know, have the intention to do it. Sometimes uh, there are challenges within uh, specific markets in terms of, of participation. Um, that have to be overcome. Um, but certainly, uh, I think from, from the research that we have done uh, on, on the topic of child online protection, um, I, I think one of the things that came out very clearly, uh, at least from the parental perspective, is that, that they do want to have a seat at the table, that they do want to be consulted, uh, that they want to have mechanisms to participate in policy-making decisions, um, but that they, um, that they don't want to do it alone, right? I mean, they want to be part of this e ecosystem, um, that there is a need to engage other actors, um, especially educators and schools, as, as, a, as a tool to, to provide additional, uh, let's say, ammunition for parents in the way that they approach some of these issues that are uh, very delicate uh, with, with their children. Um, and, and also, I think, um, um, what, one of the points that, that also came out from, from our research is uh, not only the role of, of, of government, um, but also the role of, of industry and uh, some, of, some of the examples that were mentioned, mentioned around uh, different cultural norms, different languages, um, is, is something that also comes across in, in some of the research that we, di we did in terms of having um, not only tools available for parents to use, but also awareness uh, for parents uh, so that they understand how to use those tools, so that those tools are also accessible for parents uh, in, their, in their languages, for example. Um, uh, as a way to, to really take, uh, uh, you know, a, a leading role as well in, in their child's uh, interaction with digital services. So, so I think, you know, the, the, there's a comprehensive, 
conversation that needs, that needs to be had. In, in many um, countries in the global south, uh, this conversation is just starting. Um, it has been going on in more developed markets for, for several years with legislation and regulators already being uh, put in place. But in other markets, um, I was mentioning to, to the panel that some of the discussions this morning on generative AI and some of the conclusions in, in more developed markets where, where those surveys were taken are similar to the ones that we are finding for, let's say, more well-established digital services uh, that are just being adopted uh, in, in, in many other markets. Um, so it's kind of a cyclical uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue around digital technology and, and how, it's, uh, how it diffuses around the world. Um, but certainly, uh, timeframes are, are, moving, are moving quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of joint participation is going to be very critical going forward. Patricia. Uh, yes, I hear you, uh, Daniel, on those uh, lines. But also, on the lines of policies, we cannot exclude the ones who are implementing the policies. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about implementation, we also need to have parents. We also need to have teachers equally be a part of policy making. Uh, policy makers needs to address and be conscious of the fact that we need to have uh, multi, it, it needs to be a multi-stakeholder uh, group that helps in design the policies. Um, and also uh, on the lines of product, when we talk about product, it, it needs to be with the lines of safety by design because when we're using product as an end user, uh, we look into the safety part of it. We look into the safety context of it and how I am protected as a user over here. The product is there out in the market, but the usage is done by me. The product is being used by me. So how the policies are shaping, um, of course, adding to the, uh, you know, the cultural context of it, uh, the regional context of it, the country-specific policies that needs to be uh, taken care of. The big tech companies need to, need, needs to consider the fact that, you know, uh, apart from the global standards that, that are designed, uh, that are set, but we also need to have some exceptional policies uh, with, with specific to the country so that uh, from India, if I talk about being so diverse, we face a lot of challenges over there when it comes to implementation part of it. Mm -hmm. I have myself, uh, myself experience uh, when it comes to reporting mechanisms, we feel that they're not falling into the kind of the criteria that are there. So, that needs to go hand in hand uh, with the policymakers and also the government uh, to adopt the policies that are there. And also, um, I look into more into the wider spectrum as uh, India when it comes to more state-specific policies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, policies being designed more largely, keeping into in a, into more inclusive uh, group, mm -hmm. so that we can implement it in a better fashion. We have just a few more minutes um, of this discussion before we open it up to the audience um, and so that we can hear from, from you and get some more, glean some more uh, experience and information for you. But I would love to hear from you before we go to the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Baloka, uh, we've talked about what's missing and I call it apples and onions. You know, we, we've talked about the onions, what's missing, where the problem areas are. Who can we look to, who's, who's doing some things right? Who can we look to for, and I know it's a very, it's an ever evolving, day to day, something new is coming up, especially when it comes to bad actors and how they're trying to engage with, uh, with various communities. Um, but what are some of the positives that you're seeing out there or who can we look to for people that are getting some, some pieces of this right? Yeah. No, what, what I've picked up is that, especially in the, the nature of the work that we do, uh, Normally, if we see like prohibited content, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's content that incites violence, whether it's content that expose children to um, um, uh, material that's not age appropriate, we do what you call takedowns. We, the first task is to ask, especially if it's distributed via media platforms, we will ask, uh, the law requires that you do that. We'll normally write a notice to the operators to take that down. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them, um, will cooperate without any doubt. Uh, yes, we still have got those that will take ages um, um, to do that, but I think there are others that the moment you say this is prohibited, they will take that down. I think for, for me, that's why we said what we need to do is to work closely with the industry. Um, um, I think one of the concepts that is gaining traction within the Global Online Safety Regulators Network is what you call safety by design. Mm -hmm. In other words, as we develop policy, start thinking about the safety issues. 
don't uh, once you see the uh, the um, the consequences, you start saying to them, "Hey, fix this." I think uh, that's the, the concept that all of us need to to, to embrace moving forward. You still have got, you may have those elements that are still, but the bigger industry understand that online safety is crucial, it's important because it's, this is more than work uh, for all of us. In other words, before we go to work for all these companies, you are first a parent, you are a mother, you are a sister, you are a brother. So you, I think online safety is just beyond what you do economically. It's something that we have to, I mean, like my work, I fight with my my nephews, my family members, especially the younger ones every day around classification. Mm -hmm. they, when, when Bobby, just to give you this very interesting story, like Bobby, the, the rating of Bobby, uh, previously it was for all. Now it's PG, which means no child can watch this on their own. They need to have that. And then I got confronted by younger girls and in my family. And the boys are always fascinated by my work. When I say, no, no, I classify movies, and they will ask, oh, awesome. How many movies do you have in, in your office? Say, no, it's not me, the other people that are doing that. But the, child, the, the girls are very interesting. They said, you never consulted us on the classification of babies. Now we, you are invading our privacy. I said, wow, you should consult us in the future when you do this kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, but what, what I'm trying to say, the message that I want to put across is, sometimes you may have those bad apples, but the bigger part of the industry really want to conform. They really want to assist you to deal with uh, online safety issues. And therefore, we should encourage those instead of brushing all of them with, with one brush and say they are all bad. There are others that really uh, cooperate. You still have got one or two sure. that are problematic, obviously. Well, I, I hope that the peace will remain in, in, your, in your home. And you, you won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so what we'll do now is we'll open up the floor to uh, to questions from the audience, I believe we have mics out there, and because this is being live streamed, and so um, our panelists can answer the question. If you would like to direct it to a particular person, uh, you may do so. But is there a question that we can take from the audience now? I just want to add yes. one point sure. before we go to the questions. Mm -hmm. um, to my uh, point on that, that we need to have more of trained uh, trust and safety partners and experts mm -hmm. so that you know um, when we are growing we are opening up on this avenue so we need to have more of experts coming in uh, to train on the aspects of trust and safety mm -hmm. so that we can look into the user safety aspect of it mm -hmm. so um, adding to my policy point so I just wanted to kind of bring that in before uh, any question comes to us <laughs> sure sure any questions this is a very quiet bunch after is this lunch. what happens after lunch yeah <laughs> okay Okay, we have one question. If you could just wait until someone comes to you with the mic, if you could stand up, please, if you don't mind. Or yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chuck. Uh, one of the things that uh, this panel uh, illustrates is different cultures and different contexts and even different families are gonna make different choices about what's right for their kids or what's right in their community. Um, at the same time, there's lots of efficiencies and realities that come with the fact you're dealing with global companies, global platforms, global technologies, um, and sometimes it's challenging to configure the tool in a way that is customized to a given jurisdiction. Um, in some cases, you, you can't because, for example, the tool is built with end-to-end -end encryption, and so if your community says, we don't want that, then you've kind of blown up the tool. So anyway, I think it'd be interesting to hear all of the panelists talk about how you resolve that tension. You, you have two competing values here that, that can't necessarily always be reconciled, um, and you have to work through that. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear about how that's happening in other parts of the world. Who would like to tackle that first? Daniel? Sure. Um, I, think, I think that's a, a very uh, a good point that, that you make, uh, Chuck. Uh, I think, um, at least from what we've seen is, um, it really depends on the type of service that you're talking about and the features of, of the service. Uh, at least from our, our surveys uh, with regard to parents, uh, you see that strategies vary uh, from a parental perspective uh, based on, on those factors. So there may be some issues, like you're mentioning, that are around uh, parental controls um, for a particular service that may not be customizable. Uh, but parents may use other strategies that may be offline strategies in terms of um, watching content with their children 
or um, you know, limiting the time the children can access uh, particular services depending on their age. So, so there, are, there are other tools that are not necessarily um, the customization of, of a particular um, you know, parental uh, control uh, component of, of a service that, that may be used by parents as well. And, and what we found is that uh, what, what parents generally do is they have a combination of tools that, that they deploy depending on the service and those evolve also depending on the age of the child. Uh, as children get older, parents' strategies also change. Um, my sense is, at least from the research that we've undertaken, is um, the cultural component in terms of sensitivities is, is very important for parents. Um, and and they're, they're seeking that support. It can be from industry, it can be from, uh, from schools, it can be from government. Uh, there are many actors that can, can get involved. Uh, but but at, at the end of the day, it's a combination of these factors. Uh, uh, what, what parents have told us in, in the surveys that we've done, uh, that, that is the way that they see as a, an effective way of protecting their children online. Um, at the end of the day, you know, parents are parents. Um, they're very concerned about their child's safety online and offline, um, and, and they want to, um, you know, they want to be responsible for, for, for that space and, and protect their their children. Anyone else like to? Uh, yes, I just want to add to what Daniel uh, just mentioned about in the offline version, we can also have a happy table for children, a designing of a happy table for children so that uh, children can also kind of, you know, follow what's there in the online domain and, um, and also in the offline domain. Parents can be more kind of, you know, have more conversations with the children about what, what they like in the online spaces as well to putting it uh, that understanding their perspectives also, what is that they like doing online, and hence, you know, initiating those little, little conversations with children and being a part of their lives as well, just not to kind of, you know, uh, separate them out of you have a device there and do whatever you want to do. So that adds on to the online safety aspect of um, also the relationship between um, the parents and the children over there. I think we have time for, for one more question, I think, in the front. You wait until the microphone comes to you. Hi, thank you ever so much. Um, you've spoken particularly, Dr. Baloka, about some of the challenges that you see with um, different international approaches. I'd be particularly interested if you have any um, reflections on some of the opportunities that international collaboration can bring. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question, and maybe it tallies with uh, the, the question that my, my fellow members were responding to. What it does, it allows you, first of all, to share ideas and best practices. But secondly, because you are largely like the question that was posted here, that you almost deal with these global companies that are operating everywhere, whether it's Australia, whether it's New Zealand, whether it's Fiji, whether it's Iceland. It's largely pretty much the same companies. The most important thing that international collaboration asks you to do is look at the possibility of harmonizing some of the instruments that you have to where, to where possible, to the extent where possible, especially on um, standard things. The cultural ones may be different, but largely, I think, try to harmonize where possible in such a way that, because that's what collaboration does. It brings you together. Uh, all this, because the world is, has become a global village, all of us, uh, as you can see in this room, I think try to harmonize where possible. That's why one of the things that we are running now in, in, in South Africa is to look at ways in which, as an example, to classify our rating within the continent, especially the English-speaking countries of, of, of Africa. So that when, as an example, content has been rated in another, whether Nigeria or Kenya, when it comes to South Africa, it doesn't have to go through the same way. And I think, um, that's what international collaboration assists you to do, harmonize where possible, share learning practices, and, and share ideas of, because we are dealing with the same companies. If this is how we have dealt it in particular country, and I think this, this is the model that can use, and I think we have benefited a lot out of that. Well, our time has gone by so fast, and this, this has been such a fascinating conversation for me. I hope that our audience uh, in person here in Washington, D.C., and that are watching uh, online, have gleaned some new information and feel compelled to not just 
talk about, but to do something, to implement, um, and can stay in contact with you as, um, as well. So I'm just, again, thank you very much. And we can give our panelists a big round of applause. Again, we thank you very much for joining us. My name is Anthony Robinson. Thank you very much to Patricia uh, Aurora, Dr. Uh, Baloka, and also Daniel Lesla. Thank you so very much.